we've had a pretty diverse and exciting few days, I have to say. It's been a, a great meeting. Um, yesterday we heard from Alberto, Al, Alberto Bardelli talking about clonal evolution and drug resistance in colorectal cancer, illustrating sort of the vast complexity of, of resistance in patients with uh, colorectal cancer, principally alluding to this issue of polygenic drug resistance. What that means is that resistance isn't just mediated by one somatic event in a tumour, but by multiple somatic events that can occur within the same lesion or spatially separated between lesions. And that has an impact for how we think about using targeted therapies. And I guess the recurrent theme that we're hearing both from Alberto Bardelli and from Charles Sawyers earlier on Sunday is this issue of efficient and effective combination therapies up front that will prevent tumours from going down distinct evolutionary routes when single therapies are used. Um, and so the illustration that um, Alberto Bardelli used in his talk yesterday was that resistance to tuximab, an EGFR monoclonal antibody, is invariably mediated by um, somatic mutations in pathways downstream of EGFR, um, including KRAS or mutation of the EGFR protein itself. Um, and they all converge upon this kinase called MEK, M-E-K-1. Um, and they've shown very nicely in elegant studies that, that if you provide mice with um, colorectal xenografts um, with um, a monoclonal antibody to cetuximab, uh, sorry, to EGFR called cetuximab, and a MEK inhibitor, you can essentially render these mice disease-free up to 200, 250 days, where um, with single-agent, therapy, these mice, these tumours in mice will have progressed very much before that. So I think it's a nice proof of principle that if you get the combination therapies upfront correct, predict the resistance mechanisms and treat, you know, um, the cancer effectively blocking the resistance mechanisms from occurring, you can potentially prolong uh, progression-free survival outcomes. And I think that's a, a nice way of thinking about cancers in general. Evolutionary rule book, something we're very interested in in the lab thinking about cancer evolution and battling cancer evolution to, to, and, 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 and grasping it head on when it comes to trying to improve patient outcomes, I think will be extremely fruitful in, in the next few years. So, so that was one of the sort of big highlights for me, but I think um, added to that, we heard from Richard Treisman yesterday, um, really how much more complex the, the RAS um, MAP kinase ERK pathway is than perhaps we're, we're, we're familiar with in the context of sort of um, cartoon diagrams of this path when we heard about SRF signaling and the, um, the, the way in which signaling mechanisms are integrated into the SRF pathway through GNF actin, which was really um, very thought provoking, um, and how this pathway may be involved in the invasive and migratory properties of cells as they lead their, leave their primary site and migrate to distant organs. And there's sort of accumulating and almost overwhelming evidence now of the importance of this pathway in, in generating sort of invasive migratory edge of tumours. So again, um, areas there to explore potentially with future targeted therapy approaches to try to block activity of the SRF pathway to limit invasive and migratory properties of cells. Um, from a societal level, we heard from Harpal Kumar on Sunday about um, problems with early diagnosis, how we're still lagging behind, uh, you know, the one-year survival um, outcomes um, uh, in the UK um, from solid tumours, and the question is why? Um, and this is a very complex process. It's a combination of late diagnosis, um, um, the, the issues of the fact that we have, as a nation, less access to imaging technology, so it's harder for GPs to refer patients in for um, diagnostic workup. But also there are ways in which we can get around this by having sort of red flag symptoms that, that, that prompt earlier referral to, to, to medical care, which um, we hope will, will help bring our uh, survival rates back up to levels of, say, Scandinavia and Australia. Um, sort of at uh, 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 the top of the league table. So there's a lot of work to be done there. There's a lot of investment that's required, but Harpel made the point that if you get it right, this can be very cost effective. And from a quality adjusted life, quality adjusted life year perspective, it's an extremely cost effective way of improving outcomes for our patients. And, and you know, it's, it's about £7,000 per quality, which is um, extremely good value when, when we're talking about saving lives because um, we're diagnosing cancers earlier. Yeah, several hundred million a year probably. But that money, if you think about it, will be more than um, recouped in the costs of treating end-stage disease, which is, as everybody knows, very, very expensive. 
Um, here we're talking about investing money up front to diagnose tumours earlier to cure patients as opposed to um, putting that money into late stage disease, into palliative care, where we know we can't cure patients. So it's an it's a extremely cost-effective um, um, approach, and as a, you know, Harpal presented a very compelling health economic argument for investing in this extremely important disease area. I mean, we, we have um, um, phenomenal immunotherapy sessions from Carl June and Sergio Casado showing the huge breakthroughs in CAR T cell therapy from Carl June in, in liquid tumours, um, which are having very real and measurable benefits already, and I think that field is, is primed to explode over the next five years. Um, we heard from Sergio around immune checkpoint um, blockade and, and exactly how CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies work and, and thoughts and visions for the future. So, so there's great excitement there. I think you know that field is just beginning to take off now. Um, obviously, there's a lot of hype and excitement there, but I think we'll be seeing you know, increasing and measurable, tangible benefits for patients over the next few years. So watch this space carefully. Um, we heard um, from um, Dennis Slayman and from... Um, Tim Hunt around uh, cell cycle uh, developments. As you know, Tim Hunt is a sort of doyen of this field. He, uh, he was the, the man who, who essentially discovered these oscillating protein subunits called uh, cyclins um, in the 80s and, as you know, won the Nobel Prize for medicine in the 2000s for, for his discoveries. And um, it's only now that we're seeing the fruits of his labor being rewarded in the clinic. And we heard from Dennis Slayman the introduction of CDK inhibitors that block the um, kinase component of the cyclin um, CDK interacting complex block the kinase from phosphorylating RB, releasing E2F to allow cells to go into cell cycle and divide. And as you know, in, in cancer cells, this, this process is subverted um, in, in many solid tumors, either through um, disruption and mutation of RB or through disruption of the cy cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitory factors, P16, P21, P27, and what have you. Um, and um, we've heard from Dennis Slayman the introduction of the CDK inhibitors that he really got off the shelf from Pfizer um, have been introduced into the clinic now. We've seen phase two and phase three trials over the last two years showing really profound benefit in the context of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So huge hope there and really a beautiful il illustration where basic science developments can go from the bench to the bedside in, in 10 to 15 years extremely efficiently. Um, that are resulting in survival improvements for our patients. So, so uh, you know, for, for me, I'm a, as a great advocate of basic science and its impact upon disease biology, our understanding of disease, and, and the way in which we can lead developments in basic science now all the way through to the clinic very quickly is, is hugely exciting and, and, as an oncologist, very rewarding to be able to see.